All right, time to begin. So tonight's message I've entitled, as I put this on, is it on? Yep, I think so. Is it working? No? Maybe let's try just a minute. The AV tech people have done a fantastic job. Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate their great work. Here we go. When opposites attract. When opposites attract. Well, I want to share with you from very personal experience in, in, in regards to when opposites attract. That's a common term that is used here. Two different people come together from two very different walks of life, two very different personalities, and somehow, by God's grace, it all works out most of the time. It certainly has worked out in my case. This is me and my wife, and we were married almost 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. Every year, on, we got married on January 1, 1995 there in Brisbane, and so we're about to celebrate 30 years on January 1. And so every year on January 1, I nervously wait and see whether my wife will renew my contract for another year. And praise the Lord, she has the last 29 years. So I'm hoping and praying that year number 30, she'll renew my contract for another 12 months. Now, we are very opposite Those of you who know my wife and I, you'll know we are so, so opposite. For me, well, let me begin with my wife. For my wife, a holiday is sitting by the pool, reading a book and relaxing. How many of you can appreciate that kind of holiday? Okay. For me, a holiday is doing a 10 to 20 kilometer hike most days, (laughs) riding my bike, snorkeling, using up the entire day to enjoy physical exercise. We are totally opposite, totally opposite. But yet, by God's grace, we have come together and praise the Lord for that. Well, tonight I want to talk to you about two rivals, two former rivals and how they will unite and what the Bible says in connection with these two opposites. I have this book that's up on the screen there. And if you don't have it, it's called The Great Controversy. I'd encourage you to read it. We've got plenty of copies out there in the foyer. And so feel free to pick one up and take one. If you're online and you want to get hold of this book, send us a message and give us some details how we can get this book to you. And we will if you don't have this book. This book here shares the startling truth based on Scripture. It's based on Scripture. It's a book that was um, put together by a woman who wrote it, Ellen G. White. She wrote this book after God gave her a vision in 1858. 1858, describing what the Bible gives in simple terms, what would take place at the very end of time. A book that is coming true by the minute more and more. So anyway, that's something that you'll be able to take on board when you leave this place. But we're going to begin by praying and asking God to bless and help us to understand this very important message that is straight out of Revelation chapter 13 and the book of Revelation to help us understand where we are in the stream of time and this incredible coming together of these two former rivals that you cannot predict under no circumstances, but it's happening before our very eyes and we're going to check that out. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask and pray that you'll bless our time together. Tonight, as we open your word and as we spend time in your word and unpacking these incredible prophecies that you've given to give us assurance, to give us understanding, but also to enable us to believe in you, in your word and in the promises that you have given. So bless our time as we open your word and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take a look at where we have been just briefly. We discovered this morning that we are a a world living on the brink, a world in which the abandonment of truth and common sense is commonplace, the downward spiral of morality and disintegration of society. We live in a world where there is an increase in political tension and instability, a world where there is the fear of nuclear, biological, and now cyber warfare, growing divisions, polarization, protests, and civil unrest in society, economic uncertainty, instability, and inequality, 
the great danger of technology, surveillance and security, environmental degradation. We looked at more frequent and devastating natural disasters, those labor pains that are intensifying that we looked at this morning. An increase in disease, death and destruction, religious confusion, deception and the growth of satanic spiritualism. And we also discovered that there would be fear and anxiety of what's to come that would ultimately lead to a growing call for worldwide peace and safety. And that's exactly what the Bible says, as we discovered the other night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. And of course, that's in the context of the second coming of Jesus. So that's the world that we are living in. Now, Jesus described this world to a T, more so than you and I have imagined. We looked at the first bookend of the signs of Jesus coming this morning. We discovered that Jesus said that there would be great deception before he returns. There would also be famines. There would be wars. There'd be rumors of wars. There would be disease and there'd be great earthquakes. No one's put that question in yet. I'm hoping someone puts that question in in connection with the earthquakes to deal with tomorrow night. The second bookend, Jesus speaks of what will society be like? What will what? The social fabric or where will people's thinking, where will people's minds, where will people's hearts be focused? Let's take a look at what Jesus said. This is the second bookend to the signs of the times. And after this, Jesus says, watch and be ready. And he ends the signs of the times in Matthew 24. He goes on, he shares, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37 to 39. So Jesus here is clear. He says, as it was in the days of Noah before the flood, it will be the same before I return. Now, I was scratching my head, to be honest with you, for a little while asking, what is so wrong with eating, drinking, and marrying? There's nothing wrong with that. They're just everyday experiences. That's what we do all the time. And then it hit me what Jesus here was speaking of was not that there's something wrong with eating and drinking and marrying, Nothing wrong with that at all. But what was wrong was that this was the preoccupation of the people in Noah's day. They were preoccupied with the here and now, and they had little or no interest in the hereafter. In Luke, Jesus goes on and he shares in connection with the days of Lot. Notice what he shares there. In Luke 17, 28 to 30, we read, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus here is once again making the point. Nothing wrong with these items of eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. This is everyday life, isn't it? But the point that Jesus is trying to make is that at the end of time, the greatest deception will not be the immorality, the, the violence, the population explosion in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. That's what you read of in the story of Lot and Noah in the book of Genesis. They're not the greatest dangers for those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus the greatest danger for those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus is that they become so absorbed, so what? So absorbed in the things of this world that they lose sight of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And by the way, by the way, didn't Jesus say, do not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, don't focus on those things because that's what the people out there in the world that have no focus on seeking the things of the kingdom of God are focused on. This is our great danger. 
This is our great danger. And in Luke chapter 21, Jesus goes on and he shares another interesting detail in connection with our day. Luke 21 is a parallel chapter to Matthew 24 and we've also got Mark chapter 13. And this is what Jesus said, but take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the cares of what? This life and that day, speaking of the second coming, come on you unexpectedly. Now I looked up that word carousing and the word there in the original is the word dissipation, dissipation. So I went to my dictionary to make sure I understood what that word means. And the word dissipation means overindulgence in sensual pleasures, a descent into drunkenness and sexual dissipation. Is this a characteristic of our day and age today? Absolutely. I've been to the first world. I live in the first world. And I've been to the third world. And I've been in the second world. And most other worlds in between. And I've discovered that whether you've got a lot of money or a little bit of money, it matters not. Most people today, they are focused on the things of this world. That's just how it is. Those that don't have much want to have more. Those that have a lot often are not satisfied with what they have. Isn't that right? And they want more. We are so focused on the here and now and the entertainment industry in particular. And we know that to be a fact because last year when our friend Taylor Swift came to town, literally came to Melbourne town and Sydney, four million people tried to get tickets and there were only 600,000 available. And people travelled from all around Australia, even overseas, to go and to be at that concert. Focusing on the things of this world. And that's the world that we're living in. And that's what Jesus said, watch out, because that will be the greatest danger at the end of time. Now, I know that to be an absolute fact, because a few years ago, when... This took place, and you know what this is that took place? There was one cry that was heard over and over again that was deafening. And that was, all we want is for life to get back to normal. How did you know? All we want is for life to get back to normal. I want to be able to go back to the pub. I want to go to the footy. I want to go here. I want to go there. All we wanted was life to go back to normal. We want to go back to buying and selling and building and planting and marrying and eating and drinking. Did that happen, yes or no? Was Jesus right? Yes, yes, yes. That is our greatest danger for when they cry peace and safety. We want life to go back to normal, and we're willing to do whatever it takes in order for life to get back to normal. So let's take a look at this peace idea. When you think of peace, who do you think of as the ambassador for world peace? What institution? What person? Well, if you guessed the Roman papacy, you are correct. The Roman papacy is considered by world leaders by the world as the world's peace ambassador. Let's just take a look at a few items that describe this world ambassador for peace. This was uh, a gathering at the Vatican organized by the Church of Rome. It was the 36th International Meeting of Prayer for Peace for World Religions. In the spirit of Assisi, it took place in 2022, Rome, 23rd to the 25th of October, 2022. The cry for peace. That was the headline. That was their theme straight out of Scripture. Religions and cultures in dialogue. Let me read that little bit underneath there. Religious and political leaders came together in Rome to seek for peace. Religions from Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Hinduism have come together in this appeal for peace. This year, the 36th International Meeting of Prayer for Peace of World Religions in the Spirit of Assisi. I don't have time to get into that. 
entitled International Meeting for Peace. The cry of peace will take place in Rome from Sunday the 23rd to Tuesday the 25th of October. So there we have it. The cry for peace being led out by the Roman papacy. And here we have a photograph of Pope Francis there sitting in the midst of all these major world leaders whereby more than 80% of the world's population is one of these religions, subscribes to one of those major religions that I just listed. Just the other day, like this is fresh, hot off the press. Just the other day, this uh, headline appeared on ABC News, September 5, 2024, Pope Francis and Indonesia's Grand Imam call for decisive action on climate change in joint interfaith declaration. You can't read that little bit there, but it just says Pope Francis kisses the hand of this Grand Imam of Indonesia. You have this little section here, Pope Francis and the National Grand Imam of Indonesia united in calling for fruitful interreligious dialogue during the Pope's historic visit to Jakarta. The faith leaders issued a joint declaration calling for collective action on climate change and extremism as a means to achieving global war, global peace. In the article, these words appeared. In an encounter rich with symbolic meaning, the Pope traveled to Jakarta's iconic Istiqlal Mosque for an interfaith gathering with representatives of the six religions that are officially recognized in Indonesia. That is Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Catholicism, and Protestantism. Pope Francis is the one that's seeking to gather the world religious leaders, and as we'll discover, the world's political leaders together in order to bring about peace. In order to bring about what? Peace. Just as the book of Daniel actually speaks of. Don't have time to look at those passages tonight. December 20, 2019, I'm just giving you a few examples we have the United Nations Secretary General, and he said that the, that the Pope stands for peace and harmony following his meeting with Pope Francis. He tweeted that, I'm delighted to have met His Holiness Pope Francis. He is a messenger of hope and dignity, supporting human rights, refugees and migrants, and building bridges between communities. He is a champion for the protection of the planet. We need his moral voice more than ever, says the United Nations Secretary General. And then below in that same article from the United Nations website, we have these words, peace and security. Does that sound like peace and safety? It does sound like peace and safety to me. He writes, in the, or he says, in the midst of turbulent and trying times, all the world's people must stand together in peace and harmony. Antonio Guterres was speaking following an audience with Pope Francis at the Vatican, who he thanked for his strong support for the global organization. And then just below here, he says, this head of the Roman Catholic Church is a messenger for hope and humanity. And I won't read the rest. A messenger for hope and humanity. And so we have Pope Francis, who is flavor of the month. Flavor of the month, ever since he was inaugurated as Pope in 2013. Here's one in Time Magazine front cover that came in my letterbox, New World Pope. Here's another one, Pope meets America, the people's Pope. Whoa, what happened here? I don't know. Well, I think we're going to finish real quick. I don't know what happened there. If we could go back to that, I'll, I'll let you guys go back. All right, there we go. All right, that's, that's good enough. Pope Francis, person of the year, and then this. And I've got this one to show you because this one is a real keeper. When this came in my letterbox, this was straight out of Bible prophecy. The New Roman Empire, underneath, subtitled, The Global Reach of Pope Francis. I mean, if this is not straight out of the book of Revelation, I don't know what is. These guys have no idea that they are speaking Bible prophecy on the front cover 
of the most popular, secular, left-leaning news magazine on the planet. If they're telling you, then you know what time of day it is. Absolutely incredible. It's getting close to midnight. You are indeed very right about that. This interesting docu-series came out. You can watch it on YouTube. Six-part series entitled Pope, the Most Powerful Man in History. This is CNN. This is not Hope Channel or 3ABN or Danny speaking in Seddon Church. This is CNN. This is mainstream, mainstream secular, left-leaning news magazine, sorry, a new news network there in the United States of America. Well, what about when it comes to safety? Who does the world look to as being the world's safety policeman? Who, what nation is the most powerful nation on the planet? The United, the United States of America, absolutely. The United States of America is the world's leading and the world's only superpower. So here we have it, peace and safety. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. Now, these two nations feature at the end of time in the very apex of final events in the book of Revelation, the very heart of Revelation, chapter 13, these two come together, the most unlikely alliance that you can imagine, but it happens at the end of time to bring about the final showdown. So let's take a closer look at these two powers, the Roman papacy and the United States of America that's featured in these two um, beast symbols, and we're going to look at them in just a moment. Let's first of all take a look at this first power the Roman papacy in Revelation 13 verses 1 to 10. We're going we're gonna to look at the Bible description of this beast in just a moment. But these are the following individuals that identified this first beast of Revelation 13 as the Roman papacy. This is not anything new. Have a look at that list of individuals. Hugh Latimer, Ulrich Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, John Knox, Thomas Cranmer, Nicholas Ridley, Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, John Wesley, John Calvin, and John Huss. All these individuals, when they read Revelation 13 verses 1 to 10, they said that this power is none other than the Roman papacy. And they were living during the rule and the reign of the Roman papacy. Well, what about the United States of America? The first individual that identified this power in Revelation 13, verses 11 to 17, the second half of Revelation 13, as the United States of America was a young man. He was only 23 years old at the time, a brilliant scholar. And his name was John Nevins Andrews. And in 1851, he said, based on the description of this power, it cannot be any other power other than the United States of America. He was the first one, the first one. And this power, as we'll discover, Revelation 13, 11 to 17, says will be the world's global and sole superpower that will cause the whole world to do something. Incredible. And he made this prediction when the United States population was about 5 million people. 5 million people. That was it. So let's take a look at who else spoke of the United States of America. Not in a clear way, as John Nevins Andrews did, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that helps us to understand that this is where history was leading. The second beast of Revelation 13, 11 to 17, this is what John Wesley wrote in his notes on Revelation 17, 54. He is not yet come. So this power has not yet come, but he cannot be far off for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. Now, what's all this talking about? Well, in brief, in brief, the Bible says that the Roman papacy will rule and reign for 1260 years. And that rule and reign ended in 1798, from 538 to 1798. So this power, according to Wesley, must be coming onto the scene of history soon because that period of time is almost at its end. 
He didn't know what power it was, but he knew that that power must be coming onto the scene of history very soon. He's writing in 1754, only 40-odd years before 1798. And he's saying it must be on the horizon and coming very, very soon. These three individuals, Dr. Thomas Goodwin, Isaac Bacchus, Judge John Bacon, who lived in the 17th and the 18th century, they also pinpointed this power, not as the United States of America, but as a Protestant power. Although they did not name this power as the USA, Goodwin, Bacchus and Bacon connected this power with Protestantism. Furthermore, Bacon suggested that the two horns represented civil and religious liberty. Fascinating. Well before John Nevins Andrews came to town. So as you can see, there are many scholars that are, that are looking at the biblical description and are saying that this seems like a, a civil and religious power. That's because of those two horns that represent civil and religious liberty. We're going to look at that a lot more tomorrow night, so I won't say any more on that right now. Now, Revelation makes an incredible end time prediction. It speaks of this power this power that is a beast, and the beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom or a nation that is made up of a leopard's body, a head of a lion, and feet of a bear with ten horns and crowns on its horns and seven heads. We're going to look at that very, very briefly as we take a look at what the Bible has to say. And I'll explain a few things as we go along because we don't have a lot of time, but I'll do my best to give you the Reader's Digest version, which is a very brief summary. Revelation 13, 1, this is what it says about this power. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So this is this power. There's a lot I could say. Don't have time. But this power is being represented here by, well, it's the Roman papacy that is being described. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. Let's just pause there for a moment. What is the Bible here saying? The Bible is saying that this power will be made up of the features of a leopard, bear and lion that are reminding us of the book of Daniel in chapter 7 where there are three powers that are described as lion, bear, and leopard. In the book of Daniel chapter 7, you have the lion that represents Babylon. You have the bear that represents Medo-Persia. And you have the leopard beast that represents Greece. And then you have this strange beast, this fourth beast, this nondescript beast. Here, John is describing these powers, but instead of looking forward in time, as does Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, some 500 years before, John here is looking backwards in time. He's saying we are in the days of the dragon. And he's looking back and he's saying there is a leopard, that's Greece. There is the bear, Medo-Persian, and there's the lion, and that would be Babylon. The dragon that gives this power, Rome, its power, its throne and great authority. The dragon primarily is the devil and Satan, but the dragon also represents in a secondary sense Rome, pagan Rome, because pagan Rome followed Greece. And it's fascinating that the body of this beast or the body of this power is leopard. It's leopard. Why is that? Because the Greek culture, the Greek religion, Greek philosophy, the Greek way of life, the Greek government, that infiltrated pagan Rome and it continued into papal Rome. And it continues to this day in Western civilization. We have adopted the Greek way of living. The Greek gods, Greek culture, Greek philosophy, it's all part and parcel of living in 2024. They're the undergirding foundations. I could say a lot more on that, but I won't. So the Bible says that pagan Rome would give its power and authority to papal Rome, and that's exactly what happened in history. 
the pagan Roman Empire came to an end and the vacuum was filled by papal Rome. Let's keep reading. What happens next? And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. So the Roman papacy would receive this mortal wound after it receives this great power and authority to rule for over a millennia. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. This is an incredible prophecy. There is no other nation. There is no other entity on the planet that has ruled and reigned for a thousand years or more. It has received a deadly wound and then it has had a miraculous resurrection. There is no other power on the planet. This is the only one. All the other powers, they rule and reign and they come down. And that's it. It's over. They rule and reign. They have their end. They have no resurrection. This is the only power that has a resurrection and not just in the territory where it ruled and reigned, which would be Western Europe, North Africa and that part of the world. But this is the entire world. The entire world would wonder and marvel after this power known as the Roman papacy. Now, who would they ultimately follow? Who is behind this power? We don't need to guess. Revelation 13 verse 4, so they worshipped who? The dragon, that's the devil and Satan primarily, who gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? So at the end of time, those who give their allegiance to this power and follow the dictates of this power will ultimately follow in, follow in the footsteps of the dragon and worship and, and follow the dragon. And worship is the key theme in the book of Revelation. That word comes up over and over again. And tomorrow night, we'll look at that in a lot more detail. Western civilization and pendulum swings. This passage here gives us the evidence that we have just looked at of Western civilization and these pendulum swings. We've discovered from pagan Rome, the dragon giving the seat and authority and the power to the papacy. That took place under Constantine's Christianity when he became a supposed Christian and the rise of an apostate Christian worldview. And that lasted for over a millennia. And then we have the second pendulum swing. According to the prophecy, from apostate Christianity to the French Revolution and the birth of a secular atheistic worldview where we are today. That power would receive what? A deadly wound. Isn't that right? But is that where the prophecy ends? No, there would be another pendulum swing, a third and final pendulum swing. And what will that be? From a secular atheistic worldview that we are in right now to the final worship showdown that will be characterized by signs, miracles, and wonders at its very core. And we're going to look at that tomorrow night. So this is what the Bible says will happen and this is exactly what is taking place. This was all prophesied 2,000 years ago in Revelation 13. It's all there and we are seeing it being played out before our very eyes. Now, how will the world's ambassador for peace, the Roman papacy, achieve global dominance? And before I continue on, I probably do need to share. I need to share that God here is not, zeroing in and focusing on the individuals that are part of the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church. There's over 1 billion people that say they are Roman Catholic in the world. God doesn't have an issue with people, amen? God loves all people. But God has an issue with systems and powers, be they political, be they religious, that seek to take away from the prerogatives that belong to God in particular when it comes to worship and allegiance. That's what God is against, and that's what God is pointing out. So he's not against people. Amen. Are we clear on that? God is not against people. This is not a prophecy against people. This is a prophecy where God is outlining the principles of this system. The system is corrupt, not the people that happen to be part of this system. Are we all together on that? Okay, that's really important to understand. So I thought I'd need to share that and be very clear on that. Let's continue. Now, how will the world's ambassador for peace, the Roman papacy, achieve global dominance? Well, onto the scene of history comes this second power. And this second power, which is the United States of America, 
And the handout that I'll give you tonight goes into a lot more detail in connection with that, which we don't have time for tonight, but the handout has got a lot more information on it. This power's main role, according to Revelation chapter 13, is to give the resurrection power to this first beast, the Roman papacy. It's incredible. Let's read it. Revelation 13, 11. John writes, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, speaking of the United States of America, and he had two horns like a what? Like a lamb, but spoke like who? Like a dragon. This is a powerful scripture. In this same verse, you have the tension. It's like an atomic bomb is about to explode. You've got the lamb and the dragon in the same verse going head to head. The lamb, of course, is a symbol of Jesus. It appears 29 times in the book of Revelation. The dragon is a symbol ultimately for Satan, but he worked through pagan Rome in order to destroy baby Jesus. The dragon in chapter 12 of Revelation is a symbol of Rome, pagan Rome that Satan worked through. Here you have Satan working through this power that begins Christ-like, lamb-like. And we're going to look at that a lot more tomorrow. And notice what it says in verse 12. And he, that is the United States of America, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to do what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This is speaking of the Roman papacy that will receive world dominance and the chief instigator that will bring this power back from the dead would be none other than the most powerful nation on the planet today, the United States of America. When opposites attract, these two nations are as opposite as opposite can get. And I'm going to share with you in just a little bit. The Bible says that the old world and the new world will come together in an unlikely alliance. That's why, that's why this book, The Great Controversy, has this subtitle, Will Two Former Rivals Unite? They were rivals, absolute rivals. Make no mistake. I'll give you, I'll give you an interesting um, article in just a moment. But the Bible says that Protestants... Protestant America will reach its hand across the gulf and take hold of the Roman papacy's hand to give it back its power, throne, and authority. Ultimately, the dragon will be victorious. And so when opposites attract, the cry of peace and safety, it's right there in the book of Revelation once again. So I did a little bit of research, and you can do this same research and fact check me. In fact, I encourage you to do a bit of fact checking you need to know whether I'm on board or not, or whether this is misinformation or disinformation or whatever other information, <laughs> or malinformation, <laughs> thank you. So I looked at how many meetings have taken place between presidents and popes, and I just wanted to see whether there had been an increase in the labour pains in connection with this prophecy. And I discovered between 1919 and 1969, there had been six meetings between presidents and popes. That's about one every 10 years in that 50-year period. Have a look at the last 50 years. From 1970 to 2024, there have been 25 meetings between popes and presidents, regardless of whether they're Republican or whether they're Democrat. It matters not. They have been meeting at lightning speed. That's on average once every two years rather than once every 10 years. Have the labor pains increased? Yes or no? Are these two unlikely, uh, un unlikely powers or former rivals coming together? It does appear so. Well, they're coming together very, very close right there. I mean, if they're not coming together, look, it's like how much closer can you get? Can you get any closer? Maybe that picture is a symbolic picture of how close we are. Have you ever thought about that? Now you're thinking, Danny, you have really lost it. You have really lost it. But when I looked at that, I mean, the guy looks a bit perturbed. And maybe, I'm not sure, maybe Biden has fallen asleep on the Pope. I don't know. That could very well be the case. Maybe he's just fallen asleep. 
Anyway, let's move on from there. <laughs> In 1965, Pope Paul VI was the first Pope to go to the United States of America, the first time it had ever happened. A few years later, in 1979, Pope John Paul II was the second Pope to land on the shores of the land of the free and the home of the brave, and he happened to go seven times to the United States of America. Then we had Pope Benedict in 2005, I think, 2005 was it, or 2008, no, 2008, and then the last Pope, Pope Francis, the current Pope, 2015. This was fascinating. Between 1809 and 1963, no Pope left Italy. They had not left Italy at all. Between 1870 and 1929, no Pope had left the Vatican. Can you imagine that? That's because the papacy had a, had a dispute with the Italian government that had taken away its papal states, and that's another story. But there was no globetrotting. There was no globetrotting like you see today. Whilst in the United States of America, the Pope did something unprecedented. And that word appears over and over again, unprecedented. He went and he visited the United States Capitol. And there he spoke to a joint session of Congress, including the nine justices of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, seven of which are Roman Catholic. Now, if you're wondering whether that's the percentage of Roman Catholics in the United States of America, seven out of nine, no, wrong, sorry, there's about 20 to 25% Roman Catholics in the United States of America. Seven out of the nine justices are Roman Catholics. Interesting, to say the least. We watch Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. Republicans and Democrats, Supreme Court justices, everybody was there to pay homage and to give Pope Francis an opportunity to speak to the leaders of that nation the congressmen, the ones that bring about law and order, the ones that are, are commissioned to hold fast to the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, has this always been the case? Have they always had these friendly relations? Well, certainly not. This was from The Guardian, September 12, 2015, just before Pope Francis landed on American soil. They gave this interesting article. And you can go online, you can read the whole article. America's dark and not very distant history of hating Catholics. Really? Progressives and conservatives, that matters not, are in rare unity. In what kind of unity? Rare unity. Apparently someone's able to bring the Democrats and the Republicans together. I wonder who that could be are in rare unity welcoming Pope Francis to the U.S., but anti-Catholicism was rampant before John F. Kennedy was president, the first Roman Catholic to be president of the United States of America. Joe Biden's only the second. Why? That's because there has been a fear in the United States of America founded by Protestants by and large on Protestant values that the Roman papacy and its way of doing life would infiltrate this land of the free and the home of the brave where civil and religious power are separate, which was not the case in the old world. Amen? In the old world, church and state were in bed together. And whenever church and state get into bed together, it means only one thing for those who are Bible-believing Christians, and that means persecution. So they did not want to have the same system as was in the old world. They're those two horns on that beast, civil and religious liberty. And then this came out, blow me down, blow me down. You can't make this stuff up. You cannot make this stuff up. Straight out of Bible prophecy. April 14, 2008, just before Pope Benedict came to the United States of America, why the Pope loves America. Well, I can tell you why. 
Because Bible prophecy tells us. U.S. Catholics may confound him, but America doesn't. On the eve of his first papal visit, I look at how this country has shaped Benedict the 16th. And then when you go to the story, all right, this straight out of Time magazine. This is it. The American Pope on the eve of Benedict XVI's first papal visit to the US, a revealing look at his long fascination with America and how it is shaping his vision for the world. Have mercy. Hello, anybody home? Anybody home out there? This is straight out of Bible prophecy. You cannot make this stuff up. I'm telling you, if they asked Danny Malenkov to give them a rundown of Revelation 13 and to put it on the front cover of Time magazine and inside, I would not have been able to come up with anything better than what they have. I just would not have been able to. The language they're using is far better than what I could have come up with. This is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. This was another front cover of Time magazine. They just keep rolling out. This was back on February 24, 1992. Holy Alliance. Holy Alliance. How Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. Can you believe it? These two powers, these two unlikely allies. What was that subtitle again? Are you going to be reading this book, do you think, now? <laughs> Will two former rivals unite? And you've got to remember, this book was written over a century ago. The vision was given to this woman in 1858. Is that a long time ago? This book is from 1858, you could say, even though this is the 1911 edition, but the vision was given in 1858. And by the way, heads up, the devil did his utmost to destroy the life of the author of this book so that you would not have an opportunity to read this book. True story. I could go into the details, but I don't have time. No different to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, who the enemy tried to destroy the author of that book, interestingly enough, but he survived by the grace of God. And he wrote the book of Revelation, which is the book of Revelation in this book. There is an enemy who does not want you and I to know the truth because he wants to be worshipped. He wants to deceive the whole world into worshipping him. All right. Are you ready for this one now? No, you're not ready. I can see you're not ready. You're going to need to put your seatbelt on for this one. Have you got your seatbelt on? Let me share with you from Australia's newspapers. Front page newspapers. Here we go. Are you ready? Three of you are ready. The rest of you are not ready. Ready or not? Here we go. This was from April 8, 2005, the Herald Sun and the Daily Telegraph from April 8, 2005. Passion, sorry, power and the passion of a moment in history. Two front page headlines from our daily newspapers in Australia of when the Pope, Pope John Paul II passed away and what took place at his funeral. I've got this laminated. This is the actual newspaper. I bought this one. I didn't get a chance to buy the second one, but my friend gave me that photo and I've got it up there. Let me read to you. You can't read this down below here. You've, you've got to see this. You've got to see this. All right. Now this is where I actually need to get my glasses. I knew I needed my glasses. So I apologize to the poor cameraman. I'm probably totally out of focus, but that's all right. They don't need to focus on what I'm doing right now. So let me get my glasses and read this to you because you got, you got to hear this. This is straight out of the Daily Telegraph. This is out of where? Out of the Daily Telegraph. Is that a religious newspaper, yes or no? No, it's not. Okay, let me share with you. This is what it says. After a week of extraordinary scenes, this moment on the eve of the Pope's funeral tonight was one for the history books. Until now, no US president has ever attended a papal funeral. 
yesterday, three of them knelt before Pope John Paul II's body, George W. Bush and his two predecessors, Bill Clinton and George Bush Sr., joining this heavyweight trio of presidential Protestants, that makes note, was the world's most powerful woman, Condoleezza Rice, and First Lady Laura Bush. A moment of history. A moment of history. Never happened before. There had never been one president of the United States of America go to a papal funeral. And now three turn up and they bow the knee. If that is not telling you what's coming and how close we are to the end, then nothing is. Let's keep going. So is there growing evidence that the Roman papacy is positioning itself to lead the world in the formation of the new world order? Yes, there is. When he was in the United States of America, Pope Francis addressed the United Nations General Assembly. He was the keynote speaker and his entrance into the United Nations General Assembly was if the king himself had arrived. It was like Jesus himself had arrived, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It was huge. You can go online and you can watch it and you can see what I saw. After he spoke in favor of these 17 sustainable development goals, all 193 nations signed up. They all signed up. He says we must sign up. This is a pact for world peace and safety and we have them today. This year... In a few days' time, the Summit of the Future will be held. I shared this with you the other night, this new agenda for peace and, and the papacy putting out its Summit of the Future. And Pope Francis has been invited to go. Not sure whether he will go or not. I guess time will tell and we'll one day see. This was another headline. Pope Francis becomes first pontiff to address a G7 summit, raising alarm about AI, the G7 response. First time it had happened. Not another world religious leader, but Pope Francis, once again, peace and safety. He's put out encyclicals, three encyclicals he's put out for people and for planet, I call it. Two on the environment and one on peace and fraternity. These encyclicals are fascinating and they have certainly caught the world by storm. Here is Barack Obama and he is endorsing this encyclical on the climate June 19, 2015, Obama calls for world leaders to heed Pope Francis's message. And it took off. It took off like anything. World's top three Christian leaders call for meaningful sacrifices to combat climate change. This was a joint message for the care of creation. These three leading religious figures, Pope Francis, the Archbishop Justin Welby of the Anglican Communion, the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I, they came together. That was on September 9, 2021. The very next month, a few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, there was a faith and science towards COP26. It was organized once again by the Vatican where some 40 religious leaders from all the world's religions came to the Vatican to sign this climate accord that would be presented to the United Nations um, summit, COP summit that very year including scientists that were part of signing this document. As you can see, faith and science coming together. Then back to this document on fraternity and world peace and living together, this document that was signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayeb, it was signed by the two of them, this human fraternity document for world peace and living together. Notice the date that it was signed. It was signed in Abu Dhabi on February 4, 2019. In 2020, the encyclical came out. You remember? Fratelli Tutti. That was 2020. And then at the end of 2020, you have on December 21, the United Nations General Assembly they adopted a resolution proclaiming February 4 as the International Day of Human Fraternity to observe every year. That very day, February 
before the day that that document was signed by Pope Francis and their grand imam in a Muslim nation for peace and harmony and fraternity is now the United Nations Day of Peace and Fraternity for the world. Can you see who's leading the charge? Is it clear, yes or no? It ought to be as clear as the nose on your face. So in Earth's final moments, who can provide true peace and safety to the human heart? Who can provide true peace and safety? There's only one. There's only one, and that is Jesus. That is Jesus. And Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Tonight I want to end with Jesus. He alone can give you peace. He alone is the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Yes, all these things are happening right now. And yes, all these things tell us that Jesus' coming is drawing ever near. And I believe with all my heart, unless God pulls up the handbrake again, why do I say again? Well, Jesus has been ready to come to planet Earth well before now. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus has already, he's been ready to come? But guess who hasn't been ready? Not the world out there, but the church in here. That's a sober reality. I could go and talk to you a little bit more about that, but we don't have time. We have not been ready to be used by God one final time to share with the world the message of God and his love, to display the character of Jesus Christ to the world. And because of that, the coming has been delayed. And we're still here in 2024. Unless God pulls up the handbrake one more time, I pray that he won't. I really pray that he won't this time. And I believe that he won't. Because God will say, enough is enough. Ready or not, here I come. Unless there is another delay, I believe what we are seeing and what we're going to look at tomorrow night is telling us that the coming of Jesus is drawing ever near. And the only hope and the only peace and the only assurance, if you want true peace and safety, you will only find it in Jesus. You will only find it in Jesus. You will only have it in his word. So I want to encourage you tonight to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life. I don't know where you're at in your walk with Jesus. And I don't need to know. But Jesus knows. And tonight, wherever you're at, I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life once more and to say, Lord, I want you to be my peace and safety. I want to be faithful to you. I want to be loyal to you. I want to worship you and you alone. And I want to be used by you as your ambassador for sharing true peace and safety with all those that are crying out for peace and safety. Tonight, God is giving us an opportunity to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and share the truth about where peace and safety will be found only, and that is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the blessings of your word. Tonight, Lord, we have looked at your word. We have looked at these incredible truths that tell us that your coming is drawing ever near. These things that were prophesied 2,000, 2,500 years ago, Father, they are coming to pass before our very eyes. Literally, Father, tonight we have seen on the front pages of the newspapers on the front pages of the world's leading news magazines, we have seen, Father, we are witnessing the fulfillment of those final events that will usher in the final showdown that will bring about the return of Jesus. Lord, if ever there was a time when you needed ambassadors to share the truth about peace and safety and where it can be found, it's today. It's today. And Lord, you want us to be your ambassadors for peace and safety. 
And I pray that you will use us, Lord, to light up this dark world with the light of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him. Bless us now, Father, as we go our separate ways. Bless those who are watching online and use us, dear Lord, for your honor and glory and to hasten the day of your coming because we want to go home. We want to go home. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen and Amen.